Okay, so today we're going to start Unit 9, and I ran these before I remembered to write it up here at the top. So if you would like to label this as Unit 9, so whenever I say get out your Unit 9 notes, you'll know what I'm talking about, then you can do so. Um, we have pretty much two units left for this year. We've got Unit 9, it's all about bonding, how molecules are formed, what different types of molecules can be formed. And then Unit 10 is about water solutions and acid-base chemistry. So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing some activities with, which means that if we don't quite get all of our assignment done in class, we will have to finish it at home so that we have time to do our activities back in the back. Um, there is a unit 11, but it really is just like a lab and a worksheet. So it's a really, really short thing that we'll do at the end of the semester. So today we're going to talk about valence electrons and the formation of ions. So all atoms have a certain number of electrons that are in the outermost energy level. And they're going to want to either gain or lose electrons to become more stable. So their goal is to become in the, to be in the low energy stable state. And they do that by gaining or losing electrons. And that stable state has an electron configuration of S2P6. And if we take these two numbers, this 2 and this 6, and add them together, what do we get? 8. In junior high, whenever you were first learning about atoms, you might have learned that they want to have a full octet, or they follow the octet rule. What does octet mean? 8. This is where the 8 comes from from the S and P sublevels combined together. So when it's in that configuration, it's stable, it's good, it doesn't want to change in any way, and everything else wants to be like it. So let's look at a couple examples. If we have argon, what number is argon on the table? 18. So we're going to write all of our sublevels until we get to argon, which is in which sublevel? 3P, okay? So we'll have 1S2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and how far over in 3p is argon? It's all the way, which is which number, which position? The sixth position. So you see it ends with s2p6. It's stable. We're not going to gain or lose anything. And I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but at the end of this unit, our test is going to be an open note test. So if you will be sure you're following along as we do the notes throughout this unit, then you'll have everything that you need to be able to do well on that. No, it's just going to be a, a regular old test at the end of this unit. Okay, so let's try another one, Krypton. Krypton is just one element down on the table from argon. Which sublevel do we find it in? It's no, no longer 3P, now it's 4P. So we've got pretty much the same thing as we had for argon. 1S2... 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p6. What does the fourth row start with? 4s. And then the fourth row is when it gets funny. What's after 4s? 3d. Remember the number decreases by 1. And what number goes up at the top for d? 10. It can hold 10 electrons. And then we go back up to 4p. And how far over in 4p is krypton? all the way so it's going to be six so we look at the last s and the last p sublevels s to p6 it does not matter that there's a d wedged in the middle there remember there's overlapping that's occurring kind of getting them out of order we still end with that stable s to p6 configuration what type of elements are both of those noble gases So the noble gases are the stable ones that all the other elements want to be like. So they will gain or lose electrons until they have the same configuration as that last column on the table. And we call that the noble gas configuration here. How many, well, first of all, what's the atomic number for helium? One. Hydrogen is one. Helium is two. Which means that if it's a neutral atom, it has how many electrons? two okay now we said we wanted to have a full octet eight but if helium can only have two does that mean that we're going to try to force it to have eight if it only has two no how many electrons does that very first energy level hold it only holds two 
That's how come it's complete. So that very first energy level only has one S. It's full with two electrons. Helium has the two electrons, so it is stable. And I went ahead and some of the things we've left blank in the past, I went ahead and wrote in explanations and things so there's not quite as much writing we have to do on this. So why is it virtually impossible to get a noble gas to react or bond with anything? It is already stable. It doesn't need anything else. It doesn't need to get rid of anything else. If it did, it would be less stable. We can make it happen in a lab, especially like xenon. We can make it bond with chlorine, fluorine, different things like that. Halogens normally are the things that can bond with it. But like helium, we can't make it bond with anything, even in the lab. So it doesn't need anything to make it more stable. Now, you notice in the next section here, we're going to talk about valence electrons. What are valence electrons? The outermost electrons. So that's exactly what we're going to put here. It's the electrons in the outermost energy level, and those are the ones that are involved with bonding, connecting to other atoms to make molecules. None of the other electrons that are within that are involved with that. So we don't care how many there are, what they're doing. We only care about the ones that are on that outermost ring. And it's very easy for us to figure out how many valence electrons an atom has. We just have to use our periodic table. What do we call the different columns on the table? Periods are the ones that go across, so groups are the ones that go up and down. So if we look at the group number, that's going to tell us how many valence electrons there are. And we have to be careful about this. Because there's two different group numbers whenever you look at the periodic tables that you have received throughout the year. When you look at the one on the wall, there's only one set of numbers, 1 through 18. But on every other table that you have in your possession, in addition to those numbers, you also have 1a, 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, and 8a. And the middle section here, our transition metals, are what we call the B elements. And they're different. They don't really follow this. We're not really going to look at them very much. We're going to focus on the ones that are in the A columns, the representative elements. So if I want to know how many valence electrons are in barium, I go and I look up barium, it's right here, and I look up at the top and I see what number is in front of the A. So that's going to be 2A. That means it has two valence electrons. The elements are arranged on our periodic table not just by their um, number of protons, that atomic number, but also into the different columns or groups by their characteristics, and their characteristics are determined by how many valence electrons they have. So the group number was 2A, and that's how we came up with two valence electrons. So let's try carbon. Let's look up carbon. So carbon's right here. What group is it in? 4A. So that's going to be four valence electrons. Now, before we go on, let's look at the periodic table that's on the wall. Let's say we're lazy, we don't want to get out our own table, and we just want to glance up there. What group do you see up there above carbon? 14. Above C. Okay, so it's group 14 when you look up there. Is there a way that we can end up with 4 from 14? Just take the 1 off the beginning. So if we are looking at the table on the wall... Just pay attention to that second number. So let's try that with this next one. We look up iodine, I, number 53 there. What group is it in? It's in group 17. So we pay attention to that, and it's going to have seven valence electrons. When we look it up on our other periodic table, it's also called 7A. So that's the other way we could come up with the seven. Okay, so that's going to be the first step that we're going to deal with, finding how many valence electrons are in an atom. Okay, and we're going to use that to help us draw some things on the next page. So let's go ahead and turn the page. And we're going to be drawing things called Lewis dot structures, or they're also called electron dot structures, because we're going to be drawing some dots to represent electrons. The name is very self-explanatory there. And we're going to be very specific in how we arrange the dots around the symbol. 
because that's going to tell us something about the shape that molecule is going to take on. So you have some numbers there on your paper. I want you to take your finger and put it on the one. Okay? And we're going to go in number order. So I want you to go from one to two to three to four. And then stop. And if you need to do it again, one, two, three, four. What shape are we making? One, two, three, four. Okay? So it looks like a four. Okay? Put your finger on five. Go to six. Go to seven. Go to eight. What are you doing? You're going around the outside clockwise, right? So if you start up here at five, we come over here to six, down to seven, over to eight. And if I go and continue it, what do I make? Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you can. So that's how you can remember the order if you're having trouble. After a while, you might just get used to how you put the dots on there, but that's kind of a trick at the beginning to help you remember. So, let's go through how we're going to set this up. We need to look up our element first. Sodium has what symbol? Na. So, look up Na. What column is it in? It's in column one, so it has one valence electron. And I'm going to abbreviate this as just a V and then E minus for electron. Where am I going to put that one valence electron? Right there. Now, I make my dots a little bit larger when I'm up here showing you so you can be sure and see the dots. Okay. If you want to make them a little bit smaller like that, that's fine, just so long as we can see the dot on the page. Okay. Now, this is going to tell us about how sodium can bond to other things. In order for bonding to take place, Okay, you can either share or transfer electrons, and we'll talk more about that later on in the unit. But there has to be two electrons on that side of your little symbol there to show that it's being bonded to something else. So you take one electron from one element, one electron from another, and they come together to make a pair, and that's a bond. Okay? If you already have a pair of electrons on an atom, they can't bond with anything else. Think about it like people. Okay? If you have two people and they're already together, they're not going to go try to bond with something else. They're already a couple, okay? If you have single electrons, though, okay, then they're available to go and bond with others that are also single. So there is one place where another element can come in and bond, but only where that one dot is, that one electron. Nothing else can bond in the other places because there's no electrons to help form that bond. So let's look at beryllium. What's the symbol for beryllium? Close BE. Let's look it up. What group is it in? Two. two. So there's two valence electrons. And where are they going to go? Yeah, one on each side. One on the right, one on the left. So how many single electrons are available for bonding? Two. two. So two things can bond with beryllium. And this is going to help us be able to form compounds. Nitrogen. In... If we have more, then, then, yeah, we'll follow that order. So far, we've only had two, though. So we'll see on this one, we'll have a few more, and we will see that. So there's five for nitrogen. So when we arrange these five electrons, we are going to follow that order we saw at the top. We have one on the right, two on the left, three up top, four on the bottom. And where is the fifth electron going to go? Back up at the top. Okay. The pair of electrons at the top are already paired up. They're not going to bond with anything else. How many things can bond with it? Three. Uh-huh. The electron is E minus because it has a negative charge. So. Okay. Oxygen. Oh. It's in group 16, so we can drop the one off the front and it has... Six valence electrons. It's also in group 6A. So. so those six electrons will go right, left, top, bottom, then back up to the top, and around to the right. 
So we have two pairs that are not going to have anything to do with bonding, but how many spots are open for bonding? Two. So let me show you something real quick. Don't write this one on yours. How many electrons does hydrogen have? Well, you said earlier, Jamie, one. Okay? So if hydrogen has one electron, that can fit in right here, and that can fit in right here, and what have we made? Water. And when we look at that structure, we see that water molecules are not straight across. They're not linear, but they're going to have a bent structure to them. So if you've ever seen like a, a picture of a water molecule in a book or anything like that, it looks kind of like this with your two hydrogens and your oxygen. So you have that bent structure. It's not just a side to side there. You can also have elements bonding to themselves. If we have our oxygen atom here, if we have another oxygen, and I'm going to follow a slightly different order just to kind of show you how it comes together a little bit easier, we can have a bond form between these. They're going to share those. And we can have a bond form there and share those. And now we have a molecule, two oxygens, a double bond holding them together, and then they each have two pairs that are unattached. And every time I draw a line, that's representing a pair of electrons like that. That's why oxygen's diatomic. It's O2 when it's by itself, because they're going to come together and share electrons in that manner. But for this one, you only have to have what's written in blue. Okay? Argon, pirate's favorite element. What's its symbol? R. Okay. It has how many? It's AR. I was saying R like a pirate. Okay. <laughs> How many? Eight. I said R like a pirate. Now this is going to be recorded. Okay. <laughs> it has eight valence electrons. So we've got our symbol. When it's eight, do you have to go in the special order? How many are going to be on each side? And if that's how you do your dots, that's fine. Just so long as you see two on every side like that. But you can make them a little bit larger. That makes you feel better. Okay. How many things can bond with that one? Nothing. Nothing. There are no single electrons there available. Now, helium is an exception. Its symbol is HE. And we already said it has how many valence electrons? Two. So that means that we have two electrons, and typically we would put one on each side. But that would tell us that there are two spots available for things to bond. Can helium bond with things? No, it's a noble gas. So it's going to be two together, correct. And we're going to put them both on the right side. This is the only time you will see it look like this, is with helium. Now, only argon and helium are stable. All the rest of these do not have a full octet. And the way they can get a full octet is by either gaining electrons until they have a total of eight, which is going to happen like with oxygen. You already have six. You just need two more to get to eight. Or you can actually remove the electrons that are in that energy level, make that energy level go away entirely, so that the next one in is now the outermost, and it's completely full. So if you have a small number of electrons, like one or two, then those are just going to be taken away. And we'll talk here in a minute about how to know which one it's going to do. But that process, whenever you gain or lose electrons, that's going to give your atom a charge. And do you all remember what we call charged atoms that have gained or lost electrons? It starts with an I. It's ions. Very good. And do you remember what we call the positive ions? Think about what has pause. They're cations. Cations are positive because cats have paws. If it's negatively charged, good, it's an anion. Now, here. Okay. We can still do what we need to do without filling that in, so we shall skip it. We are not done. Okay. This is what you're going to be practicing. I'm going to give you an example of each type of element you may run across. 
First thing we need to do is find the number of valence electrons. We already looked at barium before. Ba has how many valence electrons? Two. We're looking up the group number that's in front of the letter A. That's how we find it, if you need a reminder. Then we draw our Lewis dot structure. We put our symbol in the middle, and we follow that order of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It goes in that, if you want to make that into a little arrow. That didn't look very good, but try that again. Like that. So we have one, two. And I want you to add in, in the corner, how many things it can bond with. So this can bond, I put the wrong symbol. Y'all got to tell me if I do the wrong thing. I put B-E. Well, it's wrong. It's B-A. <laughs> It still has two valence electrons, though. They both do. How many things can it bond with? Remember, for it to bond with another element, it has to have a single element, I mean a single electron, that's there available. So how many single electrons are on this barium? Two. So it can bond with two other things. Something else, like hydrogen, could come in with its lone electron and make that and that. Okay, but we don't actually have that. We just have one on each side. The number of electrons gained or lost. This is where we're trying to get a full octet. We could either lose the electrons to get down to zero, or we could gain to get up to eight. And we have to figure out which is going to require the least amount of electrons moving, because that's going to be whatever's easiest. So we could lose how many to get to zero? We could lose two, or we would have to gain how many to get to eight? We'd have to gain six. So what's easier, lose two or gain six? Lose two. Go with the smaller number. What charge do electrons have? They are negative. That's why we're writing little minus signs after the E. So if I am neutral, I have no charge, and then I get rid of two negatively charged particles, I am now positive. Plus two, because I lost two electrons. And we wrote some symbols earlier in the year, but just remember, what did we do with the plus two? We switched it to where it's two plus. So it's BA two plus. That's just the format that everyone writes it in. I didn't make the rules, I just follow them. Now, just remember that if we have things with just a plus one or a minus one, we typically don't write the one. It's just implied. Like H2O, we don't put H2O1. The one is just implied. So if it was Na+, plus, it would be Na plus one, but we would just leave the one off. So that's just an example of how you would write it if you have a one charge. Okay. Nitrogen. How many electrons? Five. Five valence electrons. So when we draw our Lewis dot structure, one, two, three, four, and the fifth one goes up at the top. So how many single electrons are available for bonding? Three. The top two are already paired up. They can't bond with anything else. There are already a couple. So our choices, how many would we have to lose to get to zero? Five. How many would we have to gain to get to eight? So what's easier? Gain three. And if it helps, you can look at the dots that you drew. You can count up and see, well, there's five of them I'd have to get rid of, and then see how many empty spots there are. There's an empty spot there, an empty spot there, and an empty spot there. So it's easier to come up with those three to fill in those spots. So the charge is going to be negative because electrons are negative. We're gaining those negative particles. So then it's N3 minus. Okay. So we have an example where we lost. We have an example where we gained. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. And this is what makes carbon so good as being the element that life is based on because it can bond with how many things? Four. So it could lose four to get to zero, or it could gain four to get to eight. Sometimes it'll do one. Sometimes it'll do the other. So we're going to put both. It could gain four. It could lose four. 
And if you need to know specifically which one it'll do, I will be sure and tell you in that instance. So if it gained four electrons, what would its charge be? What charge do electrons have? They're negative. So if you gain negative particles, you have a negative charge. If you lost that negative stuff, you're now positive. So it'd be those respective ions to go with those charges. Anything that's in that column, so carbon, silicon, germanium, tin and lead are, kind of have different roles because they're metals, but the first three will do the same thing. Neon, how many? Eight. This is one of our noble gases where putting them in the order isn't really all that important. How many does it have to gain or lose to get a stable configuration, to get a full octet? It already has it, so it's not going to gain or lose anything. So what is its charge going to be? It's neutral. It has no charge. Zero. So if we were to write an ion symbol, we're really not writing an ion symbol. We'll just write a symbol. We'll put that its charge is zero. And to show that we realize that this is not really an ion, we'll throw it in parentheses there. Okay, one more. What do we know about helium? It's an exception. How many valence electrons? Two. Where are those two electrons? On the right-hand side. And I forgot to do it for neon. Think about neon and helium. How many things can they bond with? None. Because they're stable, noble gases. So it doesn't want to gain or lose. It's not going to have a charge. And its symbol looks like that. So on your assignment, you're going to run across these different types where you have to gain, lose, could be either the plus four, minus four, or it's going to be a noble gas where it's not going to want to gain or lose anything.